Good morning. Father Michael here. So, a few years ago, I was serving as a diak in a small Ukrainian Byzantine parish. Uh, about a hundred people, I would say, trying so hard to kind of reinvent themselves and uh, trying to be open to change and and to reinvigor reinvigorate its membership and uh, as well as bring in new people. Despite the fact that the pastor had borderline personality disorder, I wouldn't have known what that was at the time, but I do now as well as untreated bipolar disease. Most days, he was able to function and, and be a decent husband and dad. In the Byzantine world, uh, priests can be married. Um, but then there were those days when he would suddenly lash out at anyone who disagreed with him, even on stupid stuff, like what kind of cheese goes best on a, on a cheeseburger. Increasingly, his behavior got more and more bizarre. And he decided that he was going to make his parish more like the Roman parishes, uh, which was not a great idea as far as the <laughs> Ukrainians were concerned. They weren't really cool with that. They were not interested in in uh, setting aside their Eastern Christianity in favor of the Latin West's <laughs> theological ideas and hang-ups. Well, initially, he was my best friend and my biggest supporter in the diocese. And as I continued my seminary training and got all my ducks in a row and, you know, got ready to be ordained deacon and then priest eventually was the plan. Um, but things started to unravel. Uh, his friendship with me became increasingly tenuous because, A, uh, it was becoming clearer every week <laughs> that I stood firmly with the parishioners who were absolutely not interested in uh, Western Christianity. They were going to celebrate their Eastern heritage no matter what. And B, the other reason is because people were increasingly terrified to approach him about anything, serious or not serious. They didn't know how he would react. So. They pulled me in as the messenger slash intermediary. I was young. Give me a break. I didn't really have a <laughs> firm conception about what boundaries looked like. And it was made even worse when his own wife started to pull me into this craziness of asking me how she should approach him. Yikes. Like I said. Holding healthy boundaries was something I had to learn on the fly. And so many times, looking back, I waded out into the deep waters where I had no business going <laughs> at all. Uh, you know, yikes. But the upshot was at least 50% of the time, Father Mikhailo would, would in fact listen to me. And we would get things done, right? So that's why I kept doing it. But as his untreated mental health issues continued to worsen, he decided that people who took medications of any kind were just straight up shitty Christians. <laughs> that, that if they really believed in God and they really believed in the power of the, of the word of God, then they would... Stop taking all their medication and let God heal them the way God wants to do. Those interactions with him became more outlandish, more bizarre, 
And even when we had visitors, he pretty much chased them away. <laughs> he managed to alienate them with his abrasive tongue and his general intolerance. During Divine Liturgy one time, he had just lost a cousin unexpectedly, and he was so angry with God that he literally was kicking the altar while he was praying the prayers, cussing like under his breath. It was a disturbing, crazy time. So it's in the thick of that, in a parish I love, where people love, respect, support, all of that. In the thick of this situation, with the pastor off his medications, waiting for his miracle, uh, that the whole parish is basically praying for one of two things. Either one, uh, that he will come to his senses and take his damn meds, or B, that the bishop, with whom half the parish had already traveled to Chicago to see in person, that the bishop would transfer someplace where he wouldn't be such a menace and wouldn't destroy the very ministry he had been sent there to help save. So that's the context. So I'm in church one day, and it's late summertime, I think, and I'm cleaning and decorating, and I had wholesale buying privileges at the local uh, florist place, so I got fresh flowers on the cheap uh, all the time, and so I had picked up something and I'm arranging them in vases, and I'm picking up and straightening the pews, and I'm going to vacuum all the carpeted areas eventually. Um, and I'm and I'm in my head, and I'm praying, and I'm I'm processing, right? Um, processing my prayer concerns uh, for my own vocation, for those I love, for the parish in general. Basically, trying to talk to God about my anxiety. Um, about possibly not getting ordained because Father Mikhailo is increasingly proving to be my enemy, talking smack about me, criticizing my parenting skills uh, as a more or less single dad, and even telling people that I was having an affair with his wife, uh, which was not true, by the way. It's because she kept coming to me for advice about her own husband. So that's the crazy story. So I'm in. The, I'm doing my sacristan duties, and the big, creaky, hundred-year-old oak door of the church opens up. It's in the afternoon, and this older woman walks in, and by older I mean like my age now, <laughs> and. It's a weekday, it's the middle of the afternoon, so it's weird that anybody would just, you know, drop into a church where they don't belong. And so she walks in and she comes up to me and she tells me her name. And I notice right away some striking things about her. Number one, she apparently does not believe in deodorant because there is the smell of body odor oof, emanating from every pore of this woman. And she's also, and I'm not being mean by saying this, she is probably one of the most unattractive people that I had ever met before. Some kind of a skin disorder on her face and arms, and her hair was unruly with you know, two or three inches of gray roots showing, and you already know <laughs> how I feel about roots. Just took care of my own yesterday. So there she is. And she asks me, what kind of church is this? So I explained to her, well, you know, this is how the Byzantine Ukrainians fit into the larger history of Christianity, um, how this you know, how this form of Christianity came to the United States, um, you know, how it how it's kind of settled in the Midwest and the East. Um, and I end up giving her an impromptu historical explanation of how we came to be in that building, as well as a tour of the facility. I mean, what the heck? She's there. I got nothing but time. Well, 
And so after half an hour, 45 minutes, I've basically completed my, you know, I've told everything I know uh, about the parish and I'm continuing to straighten up and, and work while I'm talking to her. And so I have the vacuum uh, and I'm unwinding the cord and I'm getting ready to plug it into the wall. And she says to me, thank you very much, Father. I've really enjoyed the tour and our little chat today. And right away, of course, I corrected her and I said, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm not a priest. I'm just the jock. I'm just trying to catch up on some basic housekeeping in here. And she said, ah, I know, but you will be. And right at that point, I looked up to smile at her and she was gone. Yes, she was just gone. The creaky oak door did not open. I was not drunk or high. She was gone. And the only evidence I had that she was even there in the first place was her odiferousness that she left lingering on the air. I learned something today, I think, in thinking about this story. I woke up thinking about this story. Relating to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul writes about aroma. We are to God, Paul says, the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. And it has me thinking about the sense of smell in general, because I'm all about being attentive uh, and aware of the scent of divinity in Easter flowers, for example, hyacinths and tulips and lilacs will soon be popping here. I'm all about the sacred smells of incense and anointing oils and and even cologne, <clears throat> it's easy, super easy, to perceive God's presence in those kinds of smells. But sometimes, just to mess with me, and I think to mess with you as well, God sends us God's presence in the stink. God reveals God's self, sometimes in the acrid scent of someone who has been smoking blunts all day for the last week, in the whiskey breath of a homeless man who stops in asking for food, in the smell of a meth pipe burning sitting next to someone in their truck as they stop by for a prayer or a blessing. And even in the body odor of a singularly unattractive woman, who I still believe was an angelic visitor sent to me. There are all kinds of different scents in this world. But in all things, in every aroma, God is trying to break through the bubble of our cray-cray and snatch our attention and help us realize that we are not alone. We are never alone. That God always has our back. And sometimes, if we're really paying attention, we can smell the stink God leaves behind. Pray with me. Jedi narodni sine i slove Boži, bez pretenci spolive spasenje naše hodradi. Vopletite cijel od cijel Boho radici i prisno divi Mariju, 
ne preloži znovo čelovečevica. Rast misja, že hriste Bože, smrt je smrt podala. Jedin si svetija trojc. Sproslavlja je mi, Otcu i Svetomo Duhu. Spasi nas. Sej vas. Amen. God bless you.